everybody. Uh, welcome and thanks for dialing into our webinar today. Uh, my name is Charlie. I'm an account manager at Carbon Crop. Um, and Carbon Crop, uh, we're here to help landowners like you to uh, navigate the complex world of carbon credits um, and to earn money from the forest on your land. Um, and so today we're going to discuss some of the obligations associated with having land registered in the emissions trading scheme. Um, the, the registration itself is one part, but once you're in there, um, what does that actually mean and what does that look like for you as a landowner? Um, so by the end of the session, um, we're hoping that you'll feel a bit more comfortable and confident about what it looks like to be registered in the, in the ETS. Um, so, as I mentioned, my name's Charlie, uh, and I'm account manager with Carbon Crop. So, day to day, uh, my role sees me analyzing the carbon sequestration and um, and the ETS eligibility of customers' land, um, and I work directly with landholders to find the best solutions for their property. Um, I come from an arboriculture background. Um, and before I worked at Carbon Crop, I spent five years managing the urban trees for Auckland City Council. Um, and so joining us today also is our, our, my colleague Rowan, um, if yeah. you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Charlie. Um, my name is Rowan Sprague. I'm a carbon forestry specialist at Carbon Crop. Um, so that means that I provide advice about what land is eligible for the ETS or for carbon credits generally. Um, so I work with Charlie and the account management team on, yeah, providing advice about what's eligible, um, the mapping that we do and things like that. And before I started at Carbon Crop, um, I was working in wilding pine management. Um, and so I was basically working across um, community groups, landholders, and government agencies to connect everyone involved in wilding pine management and improve best practice. Um, yeah, but keen to be part of the carbon crop team. Cool. Or happy to be part of the carbon crop team. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, so first, um, the first part of this webinar, I'm going to share some info, or well, me and Rowan both together are going to share some info um, about your obligations in the ETS specifically, um, a little bit about carbon crop, um, and then we're going to dig into some questions um, towards the second half of it. So some of the questions have been submitted um, before the webinar, so we've got some slides for those and we're going to dig into those and hopefully answer them as best we can. Um, and then also there's the option for you to submit questions as we go um, through this webinar. And you can see this slide here has got a little illustration of um, the little Q&A button that you should be able to find on your um, Zoom panel there. So you can just type in your questions there and um, we'll try to answer as many of those as we have time for. Um, and there'll also be a little poll um, that'll pop up later on, um, and that's just to give us a little bit of information about how we can best present this information. Um, and you can click on the uh, pop-up that comes up on your screen to, to submit your answers. It's pretty easy. So a little bit about carbon crop. Um, so together with landowners, we're on a mission to pull a billion tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and lock it up in trees. Um, so that's contributing to New Zealand and the globe's um, climate change response. And we particularly focus on encouraging native reforestation. As, um, we also work with all sorts of exotic species as well. Um, we just have a, a real passion for native reforestation. Um, but the thing is, carbon credits can be really confusing. Um, getting land assessed and registered in the ETS has traditionally been a pretty complex and expensive process, um, especially if you've got natives. Um, and there's no guarantee that you'll earn anything after paying for your application. 
Um, and so Carbon Crop has launched itself to change that, and we have been changing that. Um, we use technology to make it simpler to earn carbon credits, um, especially if you have natives. We don't get paid unless you get paid, right? We don't get paid unless you get paid. So there's no downside to finding out what you've got and what it's worth. Um, but native regeneration has often been left out as kind of the poor cousin of pine forests. Um, a lot of the industry is really geared towards um, earning carbon credits from pine forests. Um, native forests require more effort to register them, and they also have a lower financial return. Um, but by building and using our custom tech solutions and by streamlining the processes, we've made registering natives easier and more financially viable than ever before. Um, and by removing all the upfront costs um, that have traditionally been associated with registrations, we're making it more accessible to heap small landholders. So um, we're specifically looking at ETS obligations um, today, um, as opposed to what the registration process looks like or what eligibility criteria there are. There's heaps of different aspects. And today we really just want to get into some of these obligations of what it's like to be registered. Um, and so to dig into these obligations, we're going to break it down into two parts. So, Oh, yeah, and sorry, just to jargon bust for a second, um, the ETS stands for Emissions Trading Scheme, um, and this is the carbon credit system that was created by the New Zealand government. Um, there's also voluntary schemes, um, but today we're just going to focus on the ETS. Um, and so the first side of the things is the admin side, um, so working with a government agency to maintain your registration year after year can be a pretty complex and confusing process. Um, but thankfully, this is where carbon crop comes in. Um, once you've registered your land, then we take care of all this side of things. Um, and we'll share a little bit more about the details of that in a minute. Um, and then this leaves you to look after the second part, which is looking after your forest. Yeah, cool. So. Um... In terms of the ongoing administration side, as Charlie mentioned before, that first part, um, so it's really related to what's called carbon accounting, which basically means um, keeping track of the carbon stock in your forest or keeping track of the growth or the I guess, loss of forest that can occur. Um, so that includes monitoring the changes in carbon stock, so monitoring how your forest has grown or if there's been any trees that have fallen or something like that. Um, it also means then reporting these changes in emissions returns. So um, emissions returns are basically the way that you will file to MPI to say, this is how your forest has changed over time. Um, there's two parts or there's two types of emissions returns. Um, the first type is called a mandatory or a final emissions return um, that is filed once per mandatory emission return period. Um, so right now we're coming up towards the end of the 2018 to 2022 mandatory emissions return period. So we'll be, we'll be preparing and filing those mandatory emissions returns. Um, the other type of emission return is called a voluntary or provisional emissions return, and that can be filed annually and it's optional, but it is a way that you can earn credits every year, basically, instead of the mandatory mission return, you can only earn credits um, after that mandatory mission return period finishes. Um, another part of your I guess, the administrative obligations of the ETS is monitoring and keeping track of the changes in ETS legislation. Um, so as New Zealand's response to climate change evolves and changes over time, periodically there are changes to the ETS legislation and policy. Um, so, for example, uh, this year, MPI announced that they will be ending the stock change accounting and starting 
a new type of accounting called averaging, which will be available from January. So um, that's just an example of some of the changes that can occur over time. And as a customer of Carbon Crop, we will keep track of those changes and inform you of them and let you know what your obligations are and what all this means. Um, and finally, a note about um, what's called FMA or field measurement approach. So if you have over 100 hectares of registered forest in the ETS, you have to do what's called a field measurement approach, which basically means you set up plots and you measure them and then you report that data to MPI and MPI will keep track and um, record the changes in carbon of your forest. Um, so again, that's something that Carbon Crop would help manage for you um, as a customer of us. I think that covers carbon accounting. Nice. Oh, did you want me to do this one, Charlie? Uh, I could do it, sure. Yeah, or either way. <laughs> um, so yeah. So um, your obligations when it comes to managing your forest um, and the way that we carry out the administrative side will be slightly different. Um, depending on whether you're in the permanent category or averaging a category. So I just thought I'd um, take a moment to just briefly exp explain um, the differences between those two. So um, permanent is if you're plan you're not planning to harvest your forest, right? You're, um, you're going to keep earning carbon credits as that forest keeps growing and it's never going to be harvested. Um, and most native regeneration falls into this category. Um, and then averaging, this is a, uh, the other type of carbon accounting. Um, that's if you want to harvest your forest. So if you've got a rotational forest, um, usually exotics, New Zealand is 90 something percent, 99 percent almost um, pine trees. Um, so if you're doing that kind of forestry, then you would be in the averaging um, category. So. So, okay, so say you've successfully registered some native forest in the ETS, um, then how do you look after and manage that forest? Okay, so from here, your main obligation is to keep that forest standing. Um, so continuing to grow and sequester carbon uh, more and more year after year. Um, but what this uh, entails actually is very site specific. It'll vary widely um, from site to site. Um, so things like fencing and pest control often come up um, as questions with our customers wondering what are the specific requirements around fencing? Um, well, do you need to fence your forest? Uh, it depends on the site, right? Um, the question really is, will my forest continue to grow healthily uh, if I don't fence it? Um, and the same goes for pest control. Will my forest continue to grow in a healthy and steady way if I don't do any pest control? Um, so for example, like if you have a new area of planting, so just little seedlings um, popped in the ground and that's in a paddock where stock are grazing on a regular basis. Um, well, that's obviously gonna have to be fenced, right? Cause it's just gonna get trampled and eaten and it's not going to continue to grow and um, sequester carbon. So in, in that scenario, the answer is yes, you will need to fence your forest. There's no specific requirement for you to fence it, but in your scenario, you will need to fence it. Um, and on the other hand, if your forest is like 20 years old and the stocking numbers are relatively low, um, the impact of stock being having access to that forest uh, is going to be a lot lower. Um, so in that scenario, fencing might not be necessary. Um, so another aspect of it um, is the permanence of the forest. So this is this is another of your obligations, and it kind of seems obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. Permanent is permanent. Um, so you can't let any of that forest be destroyed. Uh, you may have to repay any credits that you've earned on that bit of forest if it gets destroyed. Um, and there can also be penalties, um, especially if it's done intentionally. 
Um, there is, however, small allowances for amount uh, for little bits of clearance within permanent forest, um, and we can advise on a on a case by case basis of um, what would be allowable and what wouldn't. Nice. Yeah. So um, in terms of obligations for forests that are registered under averaging accounting, um, so it should be similar um, in part to permanent in that um, you need to ensure that the forest will keep growing. Um, so similar in terms of um, you're not required to fence or do pest control, but just as long as you're ensuring that the forest is still growing. Um, but the main difference to the permanent accounting is that you can harvest it, um, but you have to replant it once you harvest it. So you need to replant within four years. It needs to be at a certain stocking density. Um, and if you do deforest, um, so that means that you have cleared the land permanently, so you've permanently removed the forest, um, you have to pay back the, un the units that you've earned and you also need to register or remove that land from the ETS. Yeah, nice. Um, and I'll also just um, throw in there that um, we're talking about the obligations um, regarding the ETS, and there can be other obligations uh, um, as a forest owner that you may have um, in terms of fire control and pest control and things like that, but we're specifically just talking about um, obligations for the ETS. Yes, yeah. Um, so another question that we get a lot um, is about uh, fire, because it does happen. Um, and also wind as well is a big one. And landslides, less common, but also um, can happen. So um, NPI calls these temporary adverse events. And so these are events that have happened outside of your control. Um, and under the old, yeah, there's been some great changes in the legislation recently, actually, um, under the old system that it could leave you with quite a big bill. But now, thankfully, um, they've implemented this new way of managing these situations where you don't have to pay back um, the credits that you've earned on that forest. Um, so basically, you just need to notify us um, and we'll let MPI know that there's been an adverse event. Um, and so your credits will temporarily be paused. So you won't, won't earn any more credits on that bit of land because obviously it's not sequestering any additional carbon um, until um, that forest gets back to where it was when it burnt down, for example. So um, you do have the obligation to um, replant or regenerate that land um, and in terms of exotic like rotational forests they need to be replanted in a you know specific way which you would be doing anyway if you're planting a forest um and but with native regeneration in a lot of cases um the natural regeneration that comes back after the event um will be sufficient um there are some measures um after four years and after 10 years and after 20 years um like checks to make sure that it is um getting back to where it needs to be so it is sufficiently regenerating and in some circumstances if, if it's like a really difficult spot to grow or there's a heavy pest um, pressure it may need some support um, but generally speaking it can regenerate naturally by itself um, so when when the forest say say it was that you planted out a forest uh, it was 10 years old and then it burnt down your credits get paused you plant a new forest when that forest gets to 10 years old um, you would then start earning credits again. Yeah. So if that covers it. Cool. Yeah. And so this is for permanent forest. Um, so for permanent forest, you basically are registered. It's registered as a permanent forest for 50 years. And after 50 years, you have three options for what you can do. Um, your first option is you can decide the keep the forest in the permanent category for another 25 years um, and you should keep earning credits as well. Um, so MPI has indicated that for especially for indigenous forest um, the time period when you can earn credits will be extended beyond 50 years 
we know that our native forests grow for longer than 50 years usually. So um, we're expecting more information about that at some stage from MPI. Um, so the second option for your permanent forest after 50 years is you could decide to move it to averaging accounting. Um, but that would mean that you'd have to surrender your credits down to the average age of the forest. And so um, in averaging accounting, there's different average ages for forest. For indigenous forest, it's 23 years old. For radiata pine, it's 16 years old. So something to think about there. And then your third option would be that you could decide to exit the ETS altogether, um, but you would have to surrender or pay back all of the credits that you had earned from the forest during the time. Nice, thanks, Ryan. Um, and just a quick note on surrendering credits. Um, if you have the credits sitting in your holding account, um, you can just surrender them and it's very simple. If you sell those credits for money, um, in order to surrender a credit, you need to go back to the carbon credit market and purchase um, another credit to be able to surrender it. So it's a little bit about how that works. 